for you. Uh, which are, so uh, what I'm trying to say basically is that um, look for that person that is interested in you. That person that you know is genuine, is authentic. It's not just relating with you, uh, you know, in disguise as you know as a way of either bringing you down or just to uh, mark or tick the box of uh, diversity. You know, some people want to relate with you because they say, okay, we don't want to, we don't want it to look like there is racism and you know uh, that sort of thing. So look for someone who is really, really interested in you. Um, thank you. I wonder if Professor uh, Ulani Shakin wants to add anything on on the leadership there. No, no, I absolutely uh, no. That, that, that's that, that's fascinating uh, to listen to. C can I just say that you know, context matters. Mm -hmm. uh, I just painted one particular scenario, and I do really actually agree. It's, something needs to connect you to that ally in the first instance, um, and an internal examiner or even an external one then begins to build that kind of relationship. Can be a mentoring relationship can also end up being uh, a form of ally allyship. Uh, we can say that as black people in relation to uh, you know, non-black or white colleagues. We can say that as women in relation to men too when we're talking about gender. And I think those things are really very important uh, to see it through shared values. Uh, that's how you begin to know who's serious and who's not serious. And, and these days that mentoring and allyship have become things that you can also record as, oh, look at me, uh, I've done so and so. Then, as Kemi said, you have to really be vigilant to see whether, you know, who's well-meaning or not, because what's the purpose of that allyship? The purpose of it is that you have to turn the corner and transform the situation. It can't be allyship that is only by made in a statement. We have to see it in action. Um, and I have to say that, talking about mentors and allies, in my own experience, having come from uh, a program area, it's, not, it's changing in world studies, but world studies for a long time uh, was male dominated uh, and was mostly, you know, Western, global, North, white male, Anglo-Saxon male. And mm -hmm. of course, I, the only allies I had around me, I, I think there were two black people one of the years in the class. I heard one of my colleagues this morning saying when he first came to King's, there was no other black academic in sight. And that, that's true. It's changing. So ultimately, my allies were, you know, white men. One of them, like Kemi, was my internal examiner who said, what a fantastic uh, piece of work. Let's do this and this. And ultimately, you write together. So our allies, why do we have those allies? Do, they have, do we have them because it's convenient for them? Or are they going to walk, you know, through everything to, you know, to defend the cause? Uh, that we believe in, it's their mutuality in it. All those things are very important. But I, I strongly believe in the idea of allyship. We just have to be clear-eyed mm. about what that means. Um, thank you. Thank you, actually, for highlighting these key points, um, especially um, clarifying on what, what the allies or the values, the shared values. Um, I've, I've got a question which is around uh, budget and tools. Um, most of the times we hear uh, in academic institutions, especially in the UK, um, budget is a problem. So scholarship tends to be a problem. We can't send ex academics to ex conferences, and early career researchers tend to be the victims of uh, opportunities most of the time. But there's also one thing on the other end, which is um, tools, which are open source resources tools which are freely available, like today's conference, for example, which is freely available, but just giving the time, giving the opportunity to, to those researchers to be there, to be visible. Um, what, what are your thoughts around what are the tools if someone, um, if early career researchers get told there's no money? What would be the tools, strategies, approaches that they could go to or apply to bypass uh, these barriers and and be able to reach these opportunities and exploit these opportunities for uh, better visibility as well. Do you have thoughts around that? Maybe let, let me jump in on that. It's even harder. Kemi will probably also know. It's even harder for someone getting into academia to, today than it was for us and for black yeah, people in yeah. particular. Many people don't stay. Uh, uh, you know, 
for so so many reasons and these kinds of opportunities uh, are so rare and i you know having a society of black academics for me i i found extremely exciting to discover this because maybe that's a place where you know my own my own really uh, motto of never never walking alone is absolutely important uh, somebody was asking uh, in the chat whether mentors have to be older it's not age but about experience who has greater experience in the issue and who has greater opportunity and greater visibility can we do it with someone else because it's the only way to give early career academics a, a leg up uh, to consciously make a commitment that i would include early career academics it will make a commitment that the less privileged black academics in particular, because we also have early career academics who come from places where they have a lot of opportunities. Can we give those who are bright but don't have the kind of opportunities that others have a place on our research? Can we co-publish with them to give them uh, visibility? Can we co-present with them uh, in conferences and places? Can we co-develop online dissemination tools, short videos that we do together, because accompaniment is a very, that's why I said it's a lifelong relationship. Accompaniment is a big part of that uh, mentoring relationship, is a big part of the, you know, uh, forms of allyship we're talking about. And I think maybe this society can actually help us uh, put some things out there, some tools, uh, again, that would say, you know, can we find collaborations along these lines? We need to do more of that because we're never really going to have enough resources, enough opportunities to give uh, visibility to black early career researchers. There's too much isolation as well, and we need to try to bridge this. Um, anything you want to add on that, Professor Yekimi? Yeah, um, just to reiterate the fact that this um, society, um, Society of Black uh, academics is, is, is a very good one and a starting point for black early career researchers to, you know, to, to gain that uh, opportunity. Because now we are networking, we are getting to know ourselves, we are getting to hear so many things that our senior colleagues have experienced and how it has helped them. So it's, it's, a, it's a good place to start. And um, um, maybe I should also say, you know, wherever we find ourselves, I remember in my uh, my days at uh, De Montfort, uh, just because of, you know, this issue of Blacks not uh, having opportunity to, um, you know, to attend conferences and all that, and, you know, to showcase their, their research, I started a centre there, a uh, centre for um, uh, governance and sustainability, which, you know, encourage, um, I could, well, I made, I made it, you know, like, a, a, um, a center for everyone um, researching in that area. But in actual fact, it was to encourage more of our people uh, because seeing me there as the lead, uh, you know, our people all, I mean, Blacks, Asian, everyone came together to support that center. And it was more to promote what we do. And, you know, as a result of that center, I was able to uh, get um, a lot of contact from other um uh, centers, you know, that it, to, which I then introduced to uh, members of that center and early career researchers for that matter. So we're always organizing one thing, one thing or the other to assist them to um, vocalize their, their research area and also uh, that, that helped a lot of them. So those are some of the things we can do in uh, our own corners. And um, yes, um, I can't agree more with um, Fumi on the fact that, you know, this center is also, I mean, this um, society is also a good one, a starting point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just going actually to use the platform, as, as you both said, to make people visible. I saw in the chat earlier, uh, I guess it's an early career researcher who is um, seeking people who uh, research on sickle cell diseases. There's someone who's in the chat also talk about looking for collaborators around autoethnography. And um, there's also somebody who's just posted, I need postdoctoral opportunities and also need a mentor in the field of accounting and finance. And I believe we have lots of accountants uh, today in, in the session. And um, I'm going to just look at some of the questions now. Um, 
sorry, yeah, so that was just a shout out uh, for visibility for some of the early career researchers. So I'm going to take some questions. One question is, do senior academics, uh, professors, example professors also need mentoring? Um, I believe uh, Professor Ola Nishakin, you've responded to that question already. Um, do you want maybe to reiterate your, uh, the point you made in the chat for those who, who are missing on the chat? No, no, thank you. I, I, as I was saying, uh, just, uh, you know, just to reinforce the point I just made, I think everyone, everyone at every stage of their career will need mentoring because, you know, they say it's in leadership studies that Albert Murphy says, you know, uh, leaders change as situations change. When situations change, leaders change, although really on, uh, on the continent of Africa, it's really, it's not often the case. Uh, and the essence of this is that because we deal with change all the time, our context will change. Uh, even senior academics do not always deal with the same situations all the time. So you want to be able to really uh, take, you know, have a sounding board, uh, you know, talk to people who have been through that situation, get some mentoring, some coaching from them. And I, I talked about the reverse, you know, uh, uh, type of situation. Someone who's a mentor to you today or who you are a mentor to today might be a mentor to you tomorrow because they're actually more, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have greater understanding uh, yeah. Yeah. about the issues you're dealing with. So I, I, I think so. I think, you know, everyone needs mentoring. Thank you. Uh, thank you for responding to that question. There is a question from Tivdo Tili Gyadu, which is about what are your research principles and how do you impact this on your students or mentees? And this question was um, to both of you. So we'll go with Professor Yakini first, maybe. Yeah, thank you very much. I was actually looking at the question, uh, um, you know, before you came in. Yeah, my research principle, you know, like I mentioned earlier that uh, my mentor advised me then to start with my PhD. You see, uh, that thesis you have produced you have spent, some people uh, spent five years on, on the thesis. Some people, you know, three, four. So you've spent a lot of time on that thesis. And I tell you, your thesis itself is a, should be a publishable material. And if you have spent a lot of time doing that work, then you should focus on it to make sure you get quality journals, uh, uh, journal articles out of it. Now, my principle in this area is that I made up my mind, you know, before I completed my, my PhD, I published um, just on my own, although with my supervisor, uh, but my supervisor only just proofread the, uh, the, the article, but I put all, everything together and I was able to publish it in a two-star journal. That was when I was still, I mean, I th that was the preliminary study and that was the second year of my PhD. So with that, I was encouraged because I felt if as a PhD student, I could publish in two star, then what stops me from publishing the final thesis in three and four stars? And so my principle then was I made up my mind, I was not going to send any of my, my any of the, uh, the papers from my thesis to anything less than three star. So it was a principle, it was, a, and you know, you would only be able to, um, uh, you know, hold on to such principle if you have a lot of grit, a lot of perseverance, a lot of determination. So I would say uh, the principle is be determined. First, know yourself, know your strengths, know what you can do, know how, know your grit level. Um, and of course, grit can be developed, it can be built. I mean, perseverance level can be built because the game of publishing requires you uh, being able to get over all of the, you know, negative comments that reviewers send to you and not giving up. So many early career researchers would end up publishing their uh, uh, materials from their thesis into zero star, one star, because they are not patient, because they are not, they, they cannot persevere. They can, they don't have the, the, the grit to, to take all of the uh, things that come from, um, you know, the reviewers. So one, know yourself and don't work with someone else's clock. You know, you know what, and then you know your, if you know your core value and you align with it, you know what you want to achieve with your work, you know what uh, your goals are, then stick to it. See it as a long-term goal. And in actual fact, 
publishing is a long term goal, especially publishing in top journals. It's a long term goal. It's not something you can rush. Do not rush to publish. And I think that is one of the problems that early career researchers have. They just want to get published and they just keep sending all of their papers to zero star, one star, two star and all of that. You don't have to rush. It could take you five years to publish just one article. As long as that article get published in a top journal, that should be your satisfaction. So do not rush. Uh, uh, do, do not be in a rush to publish and be determined where you want your article to end up. If you are determined and you focus on it and you are you are able to persevere, you will get it there. It will it might go and come back several times, but one good thing is that each time you send an article at, out, it always come back with review comments. And those review comments are meant to enhance your work. So as review comments come and you Im improve on that work, eventually it will get published. And another principle is never do it alone. I mean, we have said a lot of that and we can't emphasize it enough. Never do it alone. You see, so many have come across a lot of early career researchers that will say, it's my work, it's my effort. I've worked on it for so many uh, for so many years and so I don't want any other person that is not my uh, supervisor to come on it. At times, your supervisor might not be available to help. You need to collaborate. You need to bring in, you know, scholars that have never been part of the research team. You need to bring them in, especially if you know their value, you know what they can add to it. So collaboration is very key. Perseverance is very important and determination to, to, to get it to the right journal is also very important. Um, is there anything, Professor Olan Shakin, that you would like to add on principle that may have been missed? Thanks. No, no, I, I really love um, uh, those uh, those ideas proposed by uh, by Kemi. I want to reinforce them. The question of who you are, your core values, need to drive you. I have often, and I would urge um, early career researchers in our midst to not just publish about anything. You've just heard about it. Don't publish about anything just anywhere. Align yourselves with people that are walking the path that you want to go. And I do realize that many senior people are not patient or tolerant of bringing people along because they just really fix, fixated on the things they want to do now. But two things I'll add to that is that of, maybe I have the luxury of doing it now. I have a 10 year research agenda. I mean, year four of it. One of the things that I think slows us down most of the time is that we have funders of research, including research councils, and that, that is changing. Who expect to have seen the results of your research uh, within uh, three years? Uh, or, you know, if it's five years, fine. Uh, but also some short-term research funding sometimes can really, really, uh, really take our attention off the mark. But why is it that way for me? because I'm deliberate in focusing on impact-driven research. And that impact-driven research would have core questions at the heart of it that you have to really, really devote a lot of time to. And to underscore, Kemi, the third thing is build, building a community around that research and being part of a community. I know that early career researchers cannot easily build that community, but if you're part of a network and you collaborate, join something. Stay with it. Promotions always need, you know, quick early publications and so on. Do something that gives you early result, results as part of a longer term project and co-create with people. That's one way of then becoming more visible and being able to publish uh, more and more and publish a wide variety of things. Thank Give you. To Thank that's you. what it says us and then, you know, do the things that you love to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions. I'm going to combine uh, the related, related ones. There's a question from uh, Mercy Denedo and Salika, which are related. So for ECRs, um, would you advise them to focus on impactful research, which requires the findings to be disseminated through other channels other than academic journals? Some universities encourage academics to focus more on publications in highly ranked journals rather than encourage impactful research. And this plays a role when determining determining who to promote. And the other question is pretty much the same. Um, any one of you who would like to go for this? Um, okay, uh, <laughs> let, let me go first. Um, 
yes, I, you know, for promotion or for career building, uh, you know, because of REF, we know that publication is one of the key things in the game of, um, uh, you know, enhancing your career in academia. And, you know, your university will, when during REF, they will only count on, of course, now impact is beginning to also have a place and in fact a very important place in ref uh, but before now we know that publication you know whether you're able to publish in top journal has always been the issue uh, but you know while publishing i would say while focusing on publishing in top journal also bear in mind how impactful your um, your research would be and how to do that is to uh, you know while you are working on the area try to consider who the audience are, just like Fumi's work that is tailored towards policy and all of that sort, sort. Who are the audience of this research? And if you could work on something that you know will impact on the audience, of course, you are beginning to build impact uh, with that research. Um, you know, like I said, I, I work on uh, reporting, uh, transparency of corporate reporting. And one of the uh, article I published uh, was on, you know, sustainability reporting, the, the, the narratives, the language used for sustainability reporting. And I used linguistic method to analyze the language of sustainability reporting. When I was doing it, you know, my interest was I wanted to see the transparency at which, um, you know, these organizations narrate their CSR activities. But, you know, Although I did not consider who the audience was, in all honesty, but unknown to me, some consultancy firm that, um, uh, for example, Radley, Radley Rad, uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, Radley Yalde or something, contacted me and they said, uh, Radley Yelda, they contacted me to say they are very interested in that work and they wanted me to assist in, um, you know, coming up with some principles and policies to guide their clients on writing their sustainability report. That's already an impact. I was just doing publication in first, <laughs> I was, I, you know, I actually aimed it for a first star, but it, it, it eventually ended up in a very top three star. But that was, I was just trying to, you know, publish in a top journal, but then it was also making an impact. Some mm -hmm. people saw it and they were interested in it. They actually interviewed me along with some um, researchers from Oxford and Cambridge as well. And they were asking for our opinion on how companies could write their sustainability report in, in the language that would really show what they have done uh, and, and, and that would you know, win their audience. And that, it was that article that brought me out. So that is um, impact. So we should while writing our, 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 our uh, uh, you know, working on our papers to publish it in Topstar, we should also bear in mind the impact that that journal may have outside. That's, uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but, you know, just using my, my experience. Yeah, thank you for that. There have actually been several questions around uh, impact journal, four star journal, five star journal, whether uh, publishing in an impact journal as the first journal is, is the way to go. Um, there's a question from Priscilla um, Ritrawu Otuwa, Otuwo, sorry. Uh, thanks both for the insights that you have provided. I realize that one thing both of you have in common is your background uh, experience in industry. Do you think that this particular experience may have influenced your desire to, contact, to conduct impactful research this, or influence practice in any way? Uh, whoever wants to go for that, Professor uh, Ulani Shakin, maybe this time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No. Very quickly. I I think in a sense maybe yes. I I. It's not whether we started from industry or whether we've been in industry as much as what drives us. What is it that mm -hmm. drives us uh, fundamentally? And I as much I love fundamental research. I always think that belongs in the university. But applied research, research that is problem solving, is something that drives me. And to really link that to what we said earlier, it means ultimately it will be in top, you know, if you would produce the output that is for journals so that it transfers, you produce output to educate uh, within the university and an output for the constituency you want to affect. 
And just to tell you, by the way, every impact case study that is for ranked four star generates more than about 50,000 pounds every year for the university. So that itself is great. Uh, and to do both is what we want to be able to achieve. Indeed, that, that's a very good answer, uh, Professor. Um, th there is another question. I think this was posed by uh, Mercy Denedo. Um, what are the workload, timetabling and funding implications to consider when planning to engage with the impact driven route to engagement in uh, academia? Um, who would like to answer this one? Workload there, is it um, university workload? Uh, I believe so. It says I think, I think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think it depends on the university you are at. Uh, if you are in a in a teaching intensive university, you are, you might not likely get much hour for research, and that will definitely impact on the work you do, because then your focus is on teaching, uh, meeting your teaching commitments and you would have very little time for research. And you know, to write impactful research, you really need time. You need time mm -hmm. to commit to the work. You need time to think because impactful research does not just come, you know, just like that. It comes with thinking, just like you mentioned earlier. Uh, um, I mean, you asked earlier whether our background has an influence on what we do. Absolutely, yes, you know, but then, for you to be able to now think through those experiences you have and bring it into your research, you need time. Uh, so the university you are matters a lot in being able to write impactful research. And you know, for research intensive university, they will always give you research hours, and that mm -hmm. is part of your workload. Uh, but if you are in a university where your workload is predominantly teaching, definitely you will have some issues with impactful research. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that response. I wonder, Adi, if uh, I've got one last question. Can I ask this or we are out, out of time completely? Um, I mean, the next uh, agenda is a break. Uh, we've okay. got a 20 minutes break, which is a lunch break, but um, we might take maybe two more questions because um, it seems many more people want to want to get clarity and then we'll yeah. go for the break. So I'll come by two in one, which is around how do we look for a mentor outside my home country since all my degrees are within my country and have and have not had opportunity of traveling out of my country? Combined with this is, can someone be a mentor from another field of research? Um, whoever wants to go for that? Uh, I, I think really, uh... You can have a mentor from almost any field, even though really, if you had one in your field, ideally at the at that stage of your career, that would be good. But I think uh, post pandemic, we now know that this form of engagement that we have here is something that is you know going to continue. So being able to have a mentor from outside your home country is possible. I would say look online for you know the ten people whose work you admire the most. Uh, who coincide with your interests, mm -hmm. um, and then reach out to them. Hopefully, two out of those ten will respond to you, and then first interact with them in the virtual space. Hopefully, they invite you to something in the institution, and then it continues. This is what I would do. Um, thank you yeah. for that response. There seems to be a lot of questions and comments again along um, publications, and I wonder, Ade, if the way about to go is maybe to kind of sum up this. Uh, session into a blog or something and that we could share in in um, in the SBA group and I do uh, know that later today we have a session which is a call to action maybe this would be one of the point of action for us which is one the mentoring there seems to have been an appetite since this morning for, for something like that and um, a lot of early career researchers today and uh, also a lot of um, attendees outside of, of UK who've been asking about mentoring, mentoring uh, from outside UK and things like that. Um, 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I know I'm between you and lunch, but it's yeah. been such a such a motivating and insightful discussion, you know. And and SBA is doing so such a fantastic uh, work. Thank you for the opportunity, um, Ade. Thank you for the opportunity um, to the whole community and all the attendees, and also our speakers, Professor Yekini and Professor Olani Shakin, uh, for being here today. And uh, with that, thank you again and uh, enjoy your lunch. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamari. Uh, Tiromani, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yakini, Professor Aloni Shakin. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We know you're very busy. And I know we, we, we went back and forth to get you here. So it was not easy to get all our speakers and our moderators, but thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we, we have our next session, which starts uh, at 12.50. And that session promises to be very uh, interesting because we've got uh, a talk on which addresses navigating the pitfalls and the challenges and we would hopefully get some practical examples from our speaker professor robert mokaya who is the pro vice chancellor at the university of nottingham and also a professor of materials chemistry but aside that we have a call to action uh, um, track which is going to be um, handled or, or spoken by professor emmanuel adegbite who is an hod HOD at, uh, in accounting at the University of Nottingham Business School. But finally, in that session, which actually would round off the day, we have a, a talk from a practitioner speaker called Dr. Becca Francin, who is the current co-chair of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at Peret Lava. Peret Lava is one of the largest recruiters for senior positions in higher education globally, and we are opportune to have them here today to come and speak to us. And that session would be chaired by Dr. Gillian Stokes, who is at University College London. So please don't go away, go for your break, get something to eat, and then we will all come back at 12.50 um, to, to round off today's um, event. Thank you again to all our speakers so far and our moderators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thank you, professors. OK, I'm sorry, I just forgot to mention something before we go. We've also got um, uh, an event coming up. Our next event would be at King's College, uh, which I forgot to mention that because Professor Oloni Shakin was here. And it would actually be our face, first face-to-face -face event, which would be sometime in November. And that event will continue the discussions about uh, how black academics can, you know, particularly uh, position themselves for promotion. So that would be a face-to-face -face event, but um, we're also organizing that to be virtual as well. So that would be sometime in November. You would have to follow us on our, on our social media platforms and um, you would get more information regarding that. Thank you. What time are we back again? Sorry. OK, so we are back again uh, at uh, 12.50. OK, thank you. Thank you.
Jillian, are you there? I am. Hi, sorry. Hello. Oh. Um, hi. So I was thinking I'm going to do it slightly differently because we've got, whereas the other sessions have been two people talking around the same thing, I kind of do want to invite people in, though, to, I do want to invite um, Emmanuel and uh, Becky's doing, a, Becca's doing a talk, isn't she? So it's completely, it's not really Q&A. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple of books I want to put up to prompt thinking as well, if that's okay. This is a, a book about that I've just read about Paul Robeson um, and one here about understanding sophisticated racism as well, which is a, a really, really interesting read. So hello, Emmanuel. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? I am great. It's such a beautiful day. I'm really hot in this room as well, but it's so noisy where I am. So I've had to close all the windows. So uh, to keep the outside noise. Oh, exactly. Oh, that. Outside. Hi, Rob. Hello, everyone. Hi, Robert. Nice to have you here. Okay. Excellent. So we're smack bang on 12.50. Shall, shall we give it? another minute or so because we didn't have a very long lunch I'm just maybe give them another minute to get back in shall we okay yeah that's fine hi Rob how are you you unmute yeah fine thank you <laughs> Um, so whilst we're waiting for people, um, if you've not uh, um, followed us on social media, please do so. Uh, on LinkedIn, we are called the SBA, the Society of Black Academics, SBA on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter as well, called the Society of Black Academics. We're on Instagram. We are even on TikTok, even though we don't use TikTok that much, but we, we, we are on TikTok. So please do follow us. Um, for our social media platforms, we also have um, um, smaller events that we do, especially targeted towards students to help students, black students. Um, so please do that. We also need volunteers as well, people who would help us with planning our next events. Uh, we've got an event coming up with King's College in November. It's going to be our first face-to-face -face event, and we would need volunteers in that regard. Moving forward as well, so please do join. Uh, do let us know if you want to be a part of our planning team. Thank you. Gillian, over to you now. Well done, Ade. You're doing a really good work. Thank you. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to make sure my clock is in front of me because one of the things that people know who know me well will go, when she gets really enthusiastic, she didn't stop. So I am going to literally put myself on a timer to make sure that I don't do that. Um, so thank you, everybody. Welcome to this fourth and sort of final session of what has been an absolutely unbelievably interesting day with some phenomenal speakers. And we have three more for you, uh, which is a great way to sort of move into the next session. As I say, the fourth session, we're looking um, in this session is sort of divided slightly differently um, because we have got uh, two particular professors who are going to talk around two different elements of um, uh, of, of, of um, moving research forward and scholarship and the impactful research and scholarship. Uh, first will be Professor Robert Makaya. Um, and I think there's three letters missing from your name. Is that OBE, I think now? So congratulations on that, which was very recent. So congratulations. Um, and Professor Makaya is from the University of Nottingham, where he's Professor of Materials Chemistry. Um, I'm going to ask you if you would just Talk a little bit about more about yourself before for a minute or two before we sort of start with the questions. So th thank you very much, uh, uh, Julian. And uh, let me also be uh, express my uh, my gratitude for being invited to today's um, uh, proceedings, but also for the very existence of the, uh, this uh, um, uh, society. Uh, so um, a little bit about myself. I. Uh, uh, I grew up in, in Kenya. I came to this country to do postgraduate studies uh, many years ago in uh, uh, in Cambridge. Um, 
uh, and uh, somehow one way or another uh, stayed. Uh, and for the last um, uh, couple of decades, I've been at Nottingham, uh, where, as you said, I'm uh, Professor of Materials Chemistry and uh, also uh, Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement. Uh, so that's that's me, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of course very interested in uh, in, in ensuring that um, you know universities research have got um, uh, communities that are inclusive and that everybody has an opportunity to be able to uh, participate and to excel. So this is this conversation today is is, is very important. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for that. And before we come on to uh, sort of asking questions about that session, I'm also going to introduce Emmanuel Adikdi. Adeg Bidze, um, who's also at the University of Nottingham, but in business school. Um, he will be doing the second sort of well, the middle section of, of this, but I would like to um, we'll, we'll sort of do introductions to you later. But if you you or Becca would like to, um, you know, maybe respond to some of the questions, if you feel uh, within each of these sections, then please do. So we get sort of more than one perspective. But um, Professor Makea, um, one of the things I have noticed uh, recently is that you have called out uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry and quite rightly so about um, the way in which you know in terms of trying to get uh, funding uh, which was highly picked up by you know the Guardian quite a number BBC as well um, in terms of that which I think you know um, applause for that um, that in itself seems like a challenge that black academics may face but what other potential or unique challenges do you think that black academics face in the process of building and, and creating impactful uh, research and scholarship? Uh, so in responding to that question, I will mainly uh, draw on my own experience. Um, and I recognise, of course, that my own experience may be quite different from um, what others are facing or are likely uh, to face. Uh, and I very much appreciate that there is no such a thing as an average experience. Um, so, but 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 there are certain things that I I, I, I suspect will probably apply uh, quite generally. Um, so, one of the things that uh, we we really need to look out for is um, is low expectations, um, where uh, you know you you are in a, in a department or you are with others, but there is a sort of uh, different expectation from you. Uh, you are not expected to to excel. You are not expected to be performing at the top level, uh, or you are not expected to um, uh, to aspire for leadership positions or whatever. So, th 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 such low expectations can actually dampen down, um, especially if if those are the signals that one is getting. You are getting signals that you are not you, you are not expected to be a head of department or or this or that. Uh, so, th so that that's what, that's something one thing that I have been. Um, I had to deal with uh, myself. Uh, the, the the other thing is um, what can be generally part was a, a a lack of sort of being uh, within the the networks that actually are the ones that drive people's performance and allow people to progress in different uh, uh, subject areas. So if 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 you're not in those networks, if you are, if people are not talking about you, people are not talking about the research you're doing, uh, people are not putting in a good word for you. And that you're not visible in those networks, um, uh, that can be a disadvantage. And uh, my own experience is that um, uh, quite often that is where the exclusion actually starts, uh, that you're not that visible and, and, and you can feel a little bit um, uh, uh, ignored. And, and, and part of that issue with, the, with, with networks is that one then is not able to um, uh, to to be in contact with the senior people who can be who can be helpful and and and, and I think we can we can relate to this idea of having people who are supportive or, or allies in different ways. Uh, but my own experience is that uh, show me anybody who has actually excelled, particularly in academia, who really never had anybody who gave them a helping hand and encouraged them and supervised them or whatever. We all we all need that, and if that is absent and. Um, uh, if we are if we are, if we are struggling to get that, and actually it 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 should not be piecemeal. It should be consistent, and it should be it should be there and and present. But sometimes that is uh, uh, lacking, particularly for uh, for, for for black uh, academics. And 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 also there is there is this idea that um, um, I, and I I say this very carefully that there are certain areas or certain subjects where. What people are expected to to gravitate towards, 
uh, if they are of a certain ethnic group and not others. Uh, and so some some subject areas are very very conservative and 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 sort of you're seen there as a uh, as, as as a stranger as an intruder uh, and 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 maybe um, it's changing now. My own subject area chemistry is a little bit um, has felt a little bit like that. Um, and 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 so that also can actually uh, have lots of limitations in the sense that um, uh, you know I, I remember the first time that I <laughs> I applied for promotion. Um, uh, and and you know um, I wasn't um, successful straight off, uh, but it was uh, a case where people who are much much who are performing uh, at a level much lower than I were promoted. So I had to have conversations with very senior leaders in the university who actually then um, somehow told me what the referees had said. And the answer, the, the, the point was that the referees had never had to deal with somebody like me applying for the grade that I was applying for. And so they couldn't get themselves to say uh, that they are doing well. Some of them actually were saying that I needed another five or six years um, to be able to, to be promoted to reader. Uh, but actually, I became a professor in, in, in less than 18 months after that. So it, it's, it's, it's that sort of uh, uh, how people are responding to you. And just we need to be aware of that. Absolutely. I mean, there is so much there. I don't know where to start, <laughs> start with that, actually. I think. Um, one of the elements I'm going to sort of like draw back to are the these notions of expectation and expectation in certain areas, certain disciplines, what some people might describe as white spaces and suddenly appearing there. I, I appeared in a white space and so I do perfectly understand that. It's for me, it's like understanding how we can build on this opportunity once we're within these spaces. How has that worked for you? How have you been able to build on that within that space? You said you got somewhere within 18 months, which is phenomenal. How do we promote and, and shout about that? So so I think um so I think first of all, one has to have a sense of their own worth and what they what 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 they're actually doing. Um, and so I have never doubted that. Um, and 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 it it is said um, without necessarily wanting to blow my trumpet, uh, because you know what's happening around you, so you know what you're yourself doing. So one of the things that is very very important is 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 that one finds an area that they are interested in and they actually enjoy working in that area. So that's what they want to do. They want to do. They don't want to do it because it seems to be the easier option. No. Uh, they don't want to do it because it is the way everybody like them is going through. No, they want to do it because that's what they want. That's what they're interested in. And that's where they want to put their uh, their effort. So so and, and that's exactly what happened to, to, to me now, realizing that actually there was nobody like me ahead of me that I could model myself on did not necessarily discourage me. But what it meant that I had to do is that um, I had to I had to, uh, to to put in the work to actually then be able to be recognized. And, and, and I think that's really, really very, very important where if that's what you want to do, uh, then you put your head down and get on with it and do the best that you can. Have a strategy of how you're going to get where you're going to be. And um, some people like to have a two year, five year, 10 year strategy. Stick with that strategy as long as it is working. If it's not working, don't stick with it. Do something, something else. But it's actually very, very important that um, in any expectations we may have ourselves, quite apart from other people's expression of ourselves, is that we are actually performing at a level that removes the whole question of performance from, from the, the discussion. And actually it becomes that people are not letting you get on to where you are. So that, that sort of performance area is, is really, really very important that, that, that you're able to, 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 um, to excel. Uh, and what I, I found very useful is um, I, when I decide who, when I when I had a career, when I decided who my competitors were, I didn't look at the department in which I was. Now, never mind that I've only ever been in two departments uh, at Cambridge and in Nottingham, but my competitors were not the people in the department. My competitors were international. And so I measured myself according to that scale. And if you do that and you drive yourself uh, up to that level, then the evidence that comes out of your work means that um, it is a lot easier than for for, for, for you to make the case that why am I not where everybody else is? How much of that then do you think requires um, a team of people around you 
to help you get there. Absolutely. You cannot do it alone. I mean, you cannot do it, do it alone. I mean, obviously, there are things that you have to do. You have to drive and you have to have the focus and all that. Uh, but what I what I have found very useful myself is I have always had uh, senior people who uh, took an interest in my career um, and um, just a few people. Um, and I realized that they were interested in me for no other reason other than to assist me get on with my career. Um, and uh, and this was, this was very they've been very, very, very helpful. Uh, and there are people I ask questions. If I had an issue, I asked them. If I wanted a reference, they wrote references for me. And so that allyship is really, really very, very important. Uh, but actually, what they also did was that they always pointed me to things that I never thought I should be doing. And they said, you can do that. You can do that. You can apply for this. You can. And, and sometimes I was a little bit timid. But, they, but, but you know, I, I then came to understand that they had my best interests at heart. And that was that is very very important. So having those networks and actually having senior people who have gone through what you're going through, listen to them, but be sure that they have your best interests at heart. And those people are all around us, and they don't have to look like you. <laughs> this is this is very true. I'm just wondering if you um, think back to being an early career researcher. What would you have said to yourself then, knowing what you know now? about you know would you would you have done things differently would you have any words of advice for yourself as an early career researcher oh that's a good question and, and, and not an easy one to to answer i can i i know what i know what to tell early career researchers now but i wonder what i'll tell my my own self uh, because actually if you look at my own oh, career if you look at my career what you see is that um and, and people will look at it and say i have moved from one stage to another and it's it's it looked like it's been very straightforward, but it has never been straightforward. Every one of those stages were extremely difficult, and it needed a lot of lot of a, a lot of work uh, to get through to them. Uh, I think what I would say to my 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 younger self is: Is this really what you want to do? Yes. Do you enjoy doing it? Uh, yes. Get on with it and do it. Don't let other people define you. Don't let other people, don't let the, the challenges and the prejudices and the and, and, and the easings actually define you. Actually think of yourself as a victor, not a victim. That is really wonderful advice. I'm, <laughs> I, hope this, I know this is being recorded, so thank, thank goodness I will refer to that. I will refer to that. That leads me on actually quite nicely to an observation that I made about the response from the Royal Society of Chemistry to um, your challenges and one of the things they said is that they believe that racism is pervasive within the Royal Society of Chemistry and that's kind of semi brave for them to say they say it's hard to challenge what's going on and it's hard to challenge the differences in funding allocations do you believe it is as hard to challenge or do you think there are things that we can do as researchers to sort of push back against these issues nothing is impossible in the wheel and particularly this particular issue, because actually I have always said that um, excluding any section of the community from full participation uh, in research and scholarship actually weakens the whole of research and scholarship. So they are not doing this. Nobody's doing this because they want to be good or nice to you and I. They are doing this that actually is good for everybody else. And once we understand that everybody understands that, then 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 actually it is possible to change things. Oftentimes, what sometimes people think or feel is that if the system changes, if they are benefiting from the system, if it changes, it will have a negative impact on them. Actually, I argue that it is not necessarily going to do that. It's probably going to have a positive impact um, uh, on them. Now, I think you have to look at it in two ways. So, um, so there are systems that have that exist. Um, now, those systems are not necessarily them, in themselves bad, actually. The systems are not bad, but actually it is how people use those systems that actually then puts the hindrances and, and, and brings about prejudice. And so it's actually how, how it is actually, it, it's, it's more of a cultural thing and getting people's mindsets to change. Now, when you get to that realm, then you realize why it is very, very difficult to change because you can restructure something but actually, if people have not changed the way they are thinking, then you still have a problem. 
And that I think that is where the problem is. But actually, we have to keep on talking about it. And when we talk about it, we don't talk about it in emptiness. We talk about it with evidence. And we look at the evidence of what the evidence is saying. And the evidence often is what challenges people the most, because it's not my opinion, but actually that's what is happening. And that challenges people most. And, and, and the only way to actually find out whether things are changing is to look at the evidence two years later. If it looks the same, nothing has changed. If it's changed, then, then something positive is, is happening. So I, I think we, we have to have all of this in the mix. Uh, and we will con some will con be convinced, some will change. But actually, you, you just need uh, a few people to change and you get on with it. But as I said, we are not going to sit around and wait for everybody to be supporting, you know, you or I or whatever. We just have to get on to uh, do what we're doing, but keep speaking up, not in an angry way, but because actually there is an issue about society improving um, for everybody. I think that is uh, very eloquently put, and I, you know, I think I totally agree with the fact that we, you know, if we challenge the system, it doesn't have to be in an aggressive manner. You know, we can, you know, we can change things from the inside. And I think there's been quite a lot of talk today about bringing people along with us. Yeah. And I think that's possibly the biggest thing that we can do as academics. And I th thank you so much for putting that in. Um, I just have to sort of talk about this, but I've just finished reading this book about Paul Robeson people and he talks about the artist as revolutionary. Um, Professor Makaya, what do you think about the black academic as the revolutionary then in this context? <laughs> um, I, I think that um, it, 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 it depends on what viewpoint one wants to take, okay? Um, and, it, and, and it may be that others looking on um, from the outside and looking at us may see that as 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 um, uh, revolutionary, but actually, fundamentally, I think that something needs to change. Um, and and in in considering that fundamental change, uh, it may not be uh, dramatic enough to feel like um, a, a revolution. But for people's individual experience and people's own journeys, it perhaps is that sort of revolution that um, uh, that, 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 that can come about. And so for us who are actually occupying this space right now, we need to recognize how important it is that for those who are, um, who are following us, that their experience is not the same as the, as, as the one that we have had. If that feels like a revolution for them, I would say, great. Um, although our mindset may, may not necessarily uh, be 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 progressing on the basis of, of of a revolution as it were. So so one of the things that I I I, I like to say is um, you know, and for anybody or any one of us, if any of us have opened any doors, if by the time we stop doing what we're doing, those doors are either closed or nobody's coming through, then in a sense we have not succeeded. If those doors are wide open and the pipeline is full with people coming through like us, then perhaps that has changed things enough to actually make it a bit, a bit, a bit like a revolution. I don't know. I've answered that from a sort of chemist's point of view, so <laughs> it, it, may, it may not be what I you're think looking it was, for. It was beautifully put. I have to say, I have a vision of these doors, sort of the revolution revolving. Who's going to go through those doors? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, finally, just do you have any tips that you think academics should be aware of to avoid mis mistakes and navigate this current system in a, a smooth way. You've picked up on a few things like, you know, maybe, you know, try and build it from the inside, you know, don't believe, be, don't be the victim. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that before we sort of close this element of the session? Yeah, now I think I think I think people forget that um, it, actually to be to be sitting around this table and having this discussion, anybody who's sitting around this table and having this discussion, need to recognize that they are already the best of the generation in which they exist. And actually, why should anybody challenge that? Why should anybody pigeon you into something that is different from that definition? Because actually, that is that is what it is. So when, when I speak to young PhD students who come to Nottingham and other universities from all over the world, I say to them, look, you are the best of your own generation. So you need to hold on to that mindset. Don't let anybody take that mindset away from, from, from you. And then, of course, um, you know, 
uh, then, 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 then get on and enjoy what you what you're doing. I think I think that's important because for me, it's not about fighting against the system because actually we are going to be doing that whether we like it or not. It is about excellence and actually having that excellence, exhibiting that excellence, and actually once that comes through, nobody can argue with it. In my own case, what has really helped me along the way is that my outputs. Nobody could argue with those outputs. They were out there and everybody could see them. So they did most of the talking. That would make what we, whatever you want to do a lot easier. If you, if you are able to articulate all of these things, it's rather like uh, somebody who wants to spend the whole day, and I say this with due respect, it's rather like somebody wants to spend the whole day talking about football and to be called a footballer, but, uh, but actually cannot play football. Now, they will listen to you if you're a good footballer and you're putting effort in playing football and people can see you're a good footballer and you're saying that you're a footballer. Now, I hope people understand that in the right context and in the way that I've said it. So it's about excellence. And there's a lot of that in this uh, group. And of course, across all of academia. And it is not necessarily only white. It's absolutely also black. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, there are a number of questions that have come up, but what I think might be quite nice is if we have our session and we all sort of address those questions, all the three speakers from this at the end, we can all feed into that. So I'm going to move on to um, Emmanuel Adegbite. And um, uh, as I said, he's at the School of um, Business. You're at Business School at the University of Nottingham. Um, could you just introduce yourself a little bit more about yourself for those of us who don't know you well? Thank you very much, Julian, and thanks very much, Rob, for setting setting the context of Faint, and thanks for your contributions also to to you know mentoring Black Black scholarship. So I'm Emmanuel. I work at the business school, just like Rob. Came here for postgraduate studies, stayed, uh, began academia. I've worked in a few places. Uh, in post 92 as well as in, in traditional research universities. And that's across Northumbria, Durham, Birmingham, De Montfort, and, and now Nottingham. So perhaps I I have seen things work in different places differently. And I use that in only in my own space across research and teaching leadership but also on many other things I do at the university around the EDI uh, and other parities such as that. So I recently was the chair for the ethnicity and gender pay gap uh, for the University of Nottingham. I'm also co-chairing the race equality uh, uh, charter implementation uh, for our bronze, successful bronze application for the university. So issues such as race and, and intersection with other protected characteristics are, if you like, apart from being professor of accounting, uh, also some of the things are, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Excellent. Thank you very much. There's quite a lot going on there then. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, you know, we were talking about today, as I said, the scene has been set very beautifully by Professor Makaya here, but, you know, what is it we can do, especially in terms of career progression? There's a lot of people here are going to be very interested in what we can do for ourselves, the routes that we can take, things that we can look out for. Um, one of the things I noticed you say you worked on the panel in terms of EDI and race for the Gold Award for Nottingham. You said, uh, bronze, sorry, bronze, bronze, award, award, yeah. bronze Award for Nottingham. Um, ha has there been anything in terms of um, issues of workload, particularly for black academics within the university that has come out or came out within your work in this area? Did you notice anything about this? Good, thank you. I, I think um, so. you've asked about workload, but a few other things around what, what practically can we do. Can I just start from what from where Robert uh, ended. I think Please the do. fundamental thing, uh, and there is no, uh, it just has to be said, the fundamental thing is excellence. You, 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 there are other ways around progressing without excellence, uh, but they are not proven rational, logical ways, and they are not ways that I think 
pin black will give you an advantage in navigating. So I think excellence has to be your primary tool, number one. Now, I think in terms of uh, looking at what we've, looking at the university data around workload, we're working around 136 actions, and that range from, um, you know, structural issues such as workload, but also experiential issues with regards to uh, how we uh, look after international staff or international students, and, and it's a broad spectrum of things. But if I look at my, if I pick my head of department part on, and I do workload planning for colleagues uh, in that space, and it often involves difficult conversations because you know you put colleagues in, in two or three or four modules, and of course people complain etc. But what what I would need to hear as an head of department is how you can influence my my you know uh, thinking with regards to doing the workload in a way that that you prefer. So it's not so I I think we all black and white shouldn't just say oh this is we, we can decide what we teach for instance we can decide you know a department has to run and we need to have that mentality of what is the best system what is the best model that would make this department work and if you have a superior logic you present that to your head of department and say, well, i think if you put me on this module i will be able to do these and these and these and that and not just oh, oh on Fridays I I have a commitment on Fridays I don't want to teach on Fridays right so th that that's really not the way we around it another thing that is very possible especially if you are say an associate professor a senior member of staff is to say well you can you know if, if you know again taking an accounting heart you can you can go to your head of department and say you know my own my hourly wage is X amount. Uh, you better, it's more cost efficient if you use me in this module that brings in this revenue uh, than this module, right? So again, you take an intellectual approach, a data-driven approach and say, well, you know, you can, you, you can achieve more if you use me as a resource in this particular way than that particular way because this draws more on my strengths or this mm -hmm. draws on, on you know, my experiences in, in, the, in that area. So I think that's important. You shouldn't just want to influence your workload from a, what would what could be seen as a selfish perspective, uh, but from a system perspective that, OK, this works better for the system, but also this works better for uh, efficient utilization of resources. And when you give, so if you want someone to change a course of action, it's useful if you give an alternative. So don't say, take me out of this module without solving that problem. So heads of department are doing many things, right? So you want to say, well, if, you know, this is an alternative model. If you take me here from here and you put me here and you put that one here, then you solve the problem. So that way you 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 do the work for the head of the department uh, in terms of thinking about what are the alternatives. Because often what it means is if someone is taking off a module, that could lead to 10 different changes because then somebody else needs to go there and that person is already on, you know, 97% and that person needs to come off something and then that person is already marking on something that needs to go. So any tiny change has to be well considered. So often when you give the solution, then it, then, then it works. So I, I hope that work, uh, helps with the workload. That does. So, I mean, so what we're talking about there is obviously um, both both uh, you and Robert have, have talked about issues of excellence. And also, I think, you know, there's a part within what you've just said there, which talks about sort of enabling us uh, using that as an enabler uh, from a systems thinking approach. How does your system work? How does the teaching system work? How does your research system work? Where are you going to get the best out of somebody? And I think you've got that very, very clearly. So apart from teaching research and public engagement activities. What other options are there for uh, researchers to promote themselves to get promoted? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, and it's important to to think about. Promotion, but the way I approach it is it's not promotion is not the starting point for me in terms of my thinking. 
what I want to be or what I wanted to be uh, as an ECA was to be a senior scholar, was to be a, an experienced scholar, a good scholar. And I think that as a starting point would make you uh, a bit more grounded in, in, in the work would help that excellence pursuit as well. So what you're pursuing is excellence and then a byproduct of that becomes the promotion. And I'm not in any way suggesting that um, promotion shouldn't be part of the goal. It should indeed be. But, but I think uh, primarily it should be, I want to write better papers. I want to develop this research centre. I want to get these grants. Uh, and I want to, I, I noticed that there is less multidisciplinarity in here. So at Durham, I, I started a center called Ethics, Organization and Society. And there were people from politics, we were from economics, we were from theology. And we were looking at these, you know, concepts of ethics from, from a multidisciplinary perspective. So it should be, I want to make a contribution to the scholarship of, of my field. And of course, uh, promotion is at the backbone, but but I, I often think if you're fixated and I want to get promoted, then it becomes a gaming exercise. So, so that's that's on a principle uh, note. Uh, but I think other things that that could be done is citizenship. So apart from the traditional, you know, research, teaching, etc., uh, but it's also citizenship. Uh, universities are confronted by very big problems, <laughs> and and uh, ranging from many things, you know. Uh, uh, and and often if we volunteer to to lead in some of these things to contribute to seven committees, uh, one of the things you get that Robert also talked about is visibility. So you get this visibility uh, and essentially people when you contribute in meetings, when you contribute in these different committees, uh, for the lack of better expression, people people see how smart you are. So they don't get to meet you only when you when you go for a promotions interview or they've written your reading your promotions document. They they know they've, they've seen you in committees that they've they've heard your contributions. They've they've heard you know the the perspective you take on things. So I think citizenship is very very critical. But I think also uh, especially for some of us who uh, you know. I have other countries, as it were, apart from the UK. We could also see this as an opportunity. So, so Robert has come from Kenya, for instance. The, you know, Kenneth Tamishi, myself. There's Adi there from Nigeria. Uh, that we could see this as opportunities where we are able to work on research questions that are more more uh, pertinent to to what could lead to impactful findings for, for our communities. And, and that's a double-edged sword in the sense that we do things that are really of value to our home homeland, but we are also doing, we are occupying and developing strength in spaces that we have a comparative advantage in. So one of the very um, important advice that I have been given, that I was given during my PhD, and that has really helped my career was, was uh, you know, during uh, at the end of the first year of my PhD, my transfer panel, my PhD was at CAS, and the gentleman called Igor Filatichev uh, did tell me, I was working on corporate governance in the UK mainly, and, and he said, you know, at Nigeria, corporate governance in Nigeria was a tiny bit of, of my research uh, idea or agenda. And he said, you know, I should play that hop a bit more and less of, of the UK. And I'm not in any way suggesting that that's, that's what everyone should do. But the advantage of that was I was able to occupy a space that was not occupied. And um, and perhaps the most most cited or most notable uh, corporate governance expert in that country uh, as a result of that. Uh, that's that's I, I very interesting. That's, I, I wouldn't... I Sorry. I wouldn't have been able to do that if if I didn't listen to that advice. So at times there are spaces that are less occupied that we can go in and stamp our footing and, and develop the work. And and so so we, we we need to be if you like creative. We need to to find niche spaces uh, where to where we can indeed um, blossom. 
but so so I think this this are things. I, I mean, uh, previous speakers have talked about highlights, for instance. This is very important, and again, it's white black highlights. Uh, th these are very important, uh, and it's also important in addition to that that you that you're not parasitic, so you're not um, you're not just f from in relationships so that you can get things out of them. Uh, you, and that's why I talked about a systems approach earlier on. So you're forming relationships that it's to some extent is symbiotic, uh, but also to some extent is you also developing relationships with people you can mentor. So once you have mentors, you're also mentoring other people. You're also giving back. And that's how that community is developed. That's how that community gets to have its own voice and not singular excellencies, as it were. That is really, really interesting. There's so much there. I'm trying to scribble down without sort of losing eye contact with you. But one of the main things that I think was so interesting is about, um, I think what you're talking about really is, is people identifying their own USP, mm -hmm. which for some people is, is is easier to do than for others. And I think often we feel like, you know, everybody has imposter syndrome. But if you're if you're going to be a trailblazer and be think creatively, as you're suggesting, think creatively, what is it that, you know, maybe hark back to your PhD, as you did with corporate governance, for example, I know you do I looked at a number of your papers and your corporate social responsibility, excellent work there. Um, but this is element of being collegiate as well, isn't there? And uh, the mentoring, I think, you know, it's come up a number of times today and both you and Robert have talked about it, the importance of that, the importance of allyship. Is there anything more that as a as a head of department, you sort of feel like, you know, that, that heads of departments could do that you feel that as, as a head, these are, the, are my sort of like my morals or principles when it comes to looking and recognizing talents and helping them progress um is there anything that you could sort of pass on yeah yeah thank you thank you i, I would say i think you raised a very important point with regards to collegiality so i'll just say a few things on that then, I, then i'll come to uh what heads of department can do or i'm doing Collegiality is very important in terms of, uh, and I think Kemi and, and a few other people have also talked about it. You, you know, you need people, right? And at times people are going to voluntarily uh, lend themselves to you. So I think it's very important that you are a collegiate person, but it's very important that you're not a difficult person. So when you work with people on research programs or, you know, people are working with research teams and things like that, they, it's important that you work well with people. It's very important. Also, it's a small community. So if you look at all the people in chemistry at, say, professoriate level in the entire country, uh, you know, you can tell me the number, Robert, but it's probably, you know, less than, you know, so it's a very small community. So people know people. Right. So if you have a bad reputation. In one place. It may go around. And when you apply for jobs, heads of department has for references, but also um, your reputation discussion can get to them. Mm. And I'm not going to say that, you know, different universities use these unofficial information uh, the way they should. So it's important that you bear in mind the reputation you're building. Uh, that's important. Now, as, as an head of the department, I, I think for me, uh, so previously I, I, I ran perhaps the largest accounting and finance uh, department in Europe, and it was a very big department. And a clear agenda for me was to develop the research of that department. It was very much teaching oriented, which was excellent. But I wanted to also have the department demonstrate excellence in, in research and funding and these other things. So I had the opportunity to grow the department for about, you know, almost 25 percent within within a couple of years. Uh, but what that meant was also to achieve other objectives with that. So I think in terms of looking at broadly BAME colleagues, I 
I think my appointments were at least 50 percent beam uh, wow. in the department. Uh, so and that's not me doing anything deliberately to, to do that. That's just me ensuring that our jobs are advertised to a wider community and that a wider community were encouraged to apply and are having formal conversations with regards to what the departmental priorities are, etc. And that the talent pool was widened and that the uh, appointment process was rigorous, but nonetheless fair and that, um, you know, uh, people who would serve on the panel would have gone through unconscious bias training and some of these things. So, and that's that's the same uh, I'm doing at, uh, at Nottingham. So I think heads of department can, can, if you like, ensure that communities are reached and that people are nudged to apply. Uh, but I think also um, it's a competitive field. And, and I would just like to highlight that, you know, uh, that you don't get a job doesn't really mean all the time that you've been discriminated against. So I've applied for jobs that I didn't get, and I, I never felt that it was as a result of anything that had to do with my race. Now, of course, there are situations like that, uh, but I think it, it's a trap we don't want to get into to be swamped on the, underneath that. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we, we we will if we keep pushing if we keep pushing we will we'll, we'll at some point uh, get get there uh, and, and especially if we're pushing for for the system of academia to get better and what you're talking about is what you can offer uh, the, the the department or the school you join in and you're driven by by that by that passion for your research for your students experience uh, rather than I just want this title, I want this this job, uh, for instance. So, so I, I think heads of department can do more by by ensuring that um, wider communities is reached by by the applications and that the the environment of work is is conducive to encourage uh, people from different walks of life and different races to to thrive, uh, but but. You know, intellectually uh, as well as um, you know, work experience-wise. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, there's there's really a lot to sort of take away there, and I know we've got a number of questions coming up. Um, but as I said, what we'll do, I think, is we're going to go across now. Thank you so much again, Emmanuel. Um, and we're going to go across to Becca now, um, who's going to talk to us about recruitment in higher education. Um, if you wouldn't mind doing a little introduction for yourself um, and then we'll come back together as a group to address some of the questions that have come up in the chat. OK, thank you. Over to you, Becca. Great. Thank you, Gillian. And uh, thank you, Emmanuel and Robert, for setting this up so nicely. Um, and thank you, Ade and the SBA, for organizing this event. Um, so I'm Dr. Becca Franson. I'm a partner at Parent Labor, um, working across our global higher education and our philanthropy, communication and engagement practices. I'm also the global co-chair for our equality, diversity and inclusion team within Parent Labor. And I'm also a member of our RISE network, which is our network to um, connect aspiring and established leaders from minoritized backgrounds um, to create a community around that. So I'll, I'll include the link um, in, in the chat function later on. So if you are interested in joining that RISE network, please do so. Um, I've been asked to speak to a, a little bit today about um, recruiting to senior positions in higher education. And I think what will be helpful is that if I speak through briefly what a process with Parrot Labor or an executive search firm looks like, um, what are some of the things that we're looking for, and then maybe go into a little bit of some of the best practices on CVs, personal statements. And I think a little bit about what Emmanuel and Robert were leading into about how to manage your personal brand, how to demonstrate excellence sort of beyond that, that surface visibility. So how can we dig down a little bit into that experience and, and draw out that excellence. Um, so as you may have seen from the event brief, uh, Parent Labor is um, does work globally to identify outstanding leaders for organizations that we feel are solving um, the biggest challenges and which have an extraordinary impact on society. Uh, we're a global top three search firm working exclusively in the public and mission driven sectors. 
Um, when we started as a firm 20 years ago, uh, we were focused exclusively on higher education, but since then we have branched out into sort of aligned sectors as well as other um, sort of mission driven sectors, including arts and culture, social impact and environment, um, research technology and innovation, knowledge exchange, etc. So do have quite a breadth of, 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 of activity now. As an executive search firm, um, what what do we do? Sort of what is our daily? What is our what is our role? But what we do is provide professional candidate search and selection for our clients. So this includes identification, engagement, um, assessment of candidates, and we're engaged by senior leadership teams to support the recruitment and and in and in challenging or niche or very very specific disciplinary roles. Um, so this may include things like uh, subject subject matter leads, heads of department, heads of division, um, professors or lead practitioners. It may include professional services leads, such as directors of HR, directors of philanthropy, strategic planning, marketing, etc. Um, it can include a uh, director or trustee roles or NED roles. So we also do governance search. And then also C-suite senior management or executive leadership teams predominantly within universities. So I think what I'll start by doing is talking a little bit about what a process is with Parrot Labor and then how that affects you as a potential candidate. So a process with Parrot Labor lasts about 12 to 16 weeks, um, so quite long. Um, but the, the engagement with you as a candidate would be about probably four to eight weeks. Um, our process is sort of marked by four clear stages and four clear outcomes from those stages. And I'll focus a little bit on the first two, because I think, again, that's what will probably impact you the most as, as a potential candidate. Um, the first stage that we do is after we've been awarded a contract with an organization, we undertake extensive briefings and consultations within that organization. And some of you may have been a part of some of these conversations within your organizations already, but we want to meet with a variety of stakeholders across that organization, across a variety of levels to understand the context. What does the what does this role mean to this organization? What are some of the challenges and opportunities that will be facing this person when they come in? And really, what does success look like and what are the skills and qualities that we're looking for that will underpin that success? The reason that I think this is really important is it allows not only that wider buy in across the organization, but it really allows that first point contact of challenge of what a good candidate is going to look like. So those those comments that often come up about, you know, credibility or gravitas or those things, we can really start to challenge those at that level. OK, you're talking about culture fit. What does that actually mean? You're talking about gravitas, but what is that going to come from? What's going to underpin that? What is credibility going to come from and start to challenge a little bit on some of those notions of, of what good what good looks like? Once we, um, the outcome of those uh, those conversations is that we pull together um, what we hope is an inclusive advertisement and further particulars document. Um, we write up a person specification again that we hope is is open and inclusive and encouraging um, of, of applicants, and then we go to the market. So that's that's sort of the outcome from that stage is that we pull together those documents, we get them out to the market, and then the second stage is us in the market. And this is the area that will probably affect you um, in in this group the most, and what you might be the most interested in. So from there, we spend um, about eight to well, it's four to eight weeks in the market, and that's that really depends on the type of role that we're looking for. The more senior it is, we tend to perhaps spend a little bit less time. The more niche or focused it is, it tends to be a little bit longer. There's fewer people for for that type of role. So this um, within this uh, is where we're out in the market, proactively seeking candidates and trying to engage you in conversation. Um, this is uh, probably the stage, as I said, that'll be of the most interest. Um, this is a first assessment, both for you as a potential candidate and for us as your search agents. And this is to see if there is that provisional fit against the brief. So, um, you know, whether it's useful to keep the conversation going, whether there's enough interest on both sides of the table. Um, the outcome of this stage is that we want to pull together a, a candidate field for our clients. So we'll we'll go to the client with a long list. Um, we go to that meeting to discuss candidates in their entirety. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this candidate field? What are candidates saying about you as an institution and the role? And then hopefully from there, we'll come together with our long listed candidates. So the next stage is our long listing, which is where we would meet with candidates um, in parent labor interviews. We would spend about 60 to 75 minutes with each candidate, again, testing um, against the brief. There will be some competency based questions within that, but also a lot about motivation. Why this role? Why now? Why this institution? And again, it's really a chance for you as an individual and as a candidate to to understand is this role for you so to, to ask more detailed questions about the role about the brief about what success is going to look like is this right for me and it's an evaluation on both sides of the table 
The outcome of this stage is that we go back to the client um, with our recommendations and we have the shortlist review meeting. And at that meeting, they would select probably the five or so that they will carry forward to a final interview. And that's the final stage. So that final stage is you as a candidate meeting with the client organization, a series of meetings, hopefully both interesting and challenging and stretching, but also again, improving your understanding of the role of the institution. And so that when we get to that final point, if you are the preferred candidate, there's a very good sense of if this is the right role for you and if you're the right person for them. So that's really what we're trying to get to. Those final stages are fully supported by us. So um, sort of salary negotiations are supported by us in order to maintain good relationships all around to ensure that you're getting the very best out of that institution and that their expectations are managed as well. So that's, that's sort of the full package that we provide as, as your search consultants. Um, I raise this process because I do think that it's important um, and helpful to understand the role of the search consultant and how we're on hand to help, help you as a candidate or as a client organization and how to make informed decisions and get the most out of the process. Um, so whilst we do undertake a bespoke search for every and each and every assignment, I think there are some consistent things that you can do to ensure that you're on our radar as a potential candidate and help us reach you. Um, so the first thing is, you know, answer our emails. <laughs> we will send out a number of emails. You've probably all got them. You might look at it. You might look at the title and think, oh God, another one. You know, just take a look. Do come back to us. If it's not for you, tell us and tell us why and tell us what you are looking for. Um, but that is just as important as, as coming back to us and saying, you know what, I'm not the right fit for this or telling us, asking us why we think you're the right fit for it. For it, help us help you in understanding is there a right fit, and if this isn't it, what might be? So do do look at that email, engage with us, and and help us make that decision. Um, if you have, if we haven't called you, call us, um, and that is again really important. And and we do try to map the known world in terms of of experts, in terms of you know areas of expertise, in terms of interest there will inevitably be people that we miss. So if you see something and we are um, we are supporting it, we will always put a name with the advertisement, a direct person to contact, pick up the phone, send an email, contact that person, say, if, say it's of interest. If again, you get to the point where this is not a, a role for you and you decide not to apply, you are still on the radar. We still have an understanding of the types of things that might be of interest to you. And now you're engaged, right? You're, you, we understand the types of roles. The next one we reach out to you with will be more relevant, more of more interest, and hopefully we will get to that right fit. And do ask us for our advice and our thoughts. Um, our job is to help you assess if you are right for a given role. And if you're not sure, ask us. But also do you know try to submit CVs and letters early. We look at these all day, every day. We want to provide feedback. If you get your CV in early, your your hopefully your search consultant or research associate will be able to say, actually, this is the experience you can draw on more. This covering letter could be a bit more specific as to your experience. Let's find a way that we can that we can draw that out a little bit more. How can we un uncover some of that excellence? The other thing, and it does feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, is do have a public profile. It is ironic me saying this, mine's terrible, <laughs> but do, do put a public profile out there. Um, and this will include LinkedIn, ResearchGate, Academia.edu, university websites, personal web pages. You know, do, do get it out there. The more that we can find about you, the more your interest, expertise, the more that's out there, the more um, we are likely to get in touch. And keep that profile up to date. Um, be expansive in describing your role. You might be an associate head of a department already, but unless we know that, unless it's out there somewhere, we may not be able to pick you up as, as a candidate for a potential role. Do think about sort of keyword Boolean searches, your aspirations in terms of your next role and get those things out there. If you are an associate director and you're looking for a director role, put that on your LinkedIn profile, aspiring director. That will make you searchable to us for that type of role. So get that information out there. And finally, follow up with feedback. I think that's really important to, to ask us for specific feedback. I think we at Parrot Labor are really committed to giving feedback to candidates but if you don't get it or you're not satisfied with it follow up ask us ask us what went wrong ask us what you could do better ask us if there were some issues you know hopefully we we want to see you succeed we want good candidates in the frame so we will support you through that um, so now that you are engaged, now that we're, we're, we're having a conversation, you've answered the email and, and you're speaking to your search consultant, um, there are a few things in terms of leadership roles that we are looking for. And I think that this might be helpful just in terms of, again, some of those things that you can draw out in your profiles. So we are looking for initiative and drive. 
you know, universities want leaders who will take them places. So show what you've done in your university, in your department, for your discipline. Um, if you're pushing into the next level of leadership, help us see what you're already doing at that level. So what are you doing outside of your current remit? How are you pushing the envelope? How are you working pan institutionally or outside of your department or interdisciplinarily? You know, really do draw that out for us and help us see it. Evidence of delivering. I think many candidates um, will tell, tell us what they've done, but not necessarily how they've done it or what the impact is. So draw that story out for us. Give us, don't just give us your responsibilities. Tell us what you've done. What is the impact of what you've done and, and how have you delivered that? It is important to talk a little bit about your scale and management responsibilities. You might be only leading a team of three. If your aspiration is to lead a team of 20, talk about leadership, talk about how you lead outside of your team. How do you develop those leadership skills? How have you improved that over time? Again, it's going to be really helpful. I think another area that is really important is about adaptability and transferability. And I think that this is really an important one, especially if you're looking to transfer sectors or roles or look for an area outside of your expertise. And I think what's important, and I think Emmanuel, you mentioned this, is that these are competitive processes and you will be up against people where this is their expertise and they've sort of done the job before. So think a little bit about that and what value you are going to add by bringing a different perspective knowledge that this is a this is an aberration for you that this is slightly different but this is the core competency that you bring in this is why it's relevant draw out that linkage and help us understand it and help us help the client understand it as well i think um, a couple of other points is about self-awareness and growth you know we don't organizations don't really want someone who knows knows everything, um, but they want people who know that there's things that they don't know. So be reflective about what that might be. What are the steps and challenges that you might that you anticipate facing? What are the learning curves and how are you going to overcome them? And then inclusive leadership and value add. We talk a lot about diversity and inclusivity, but I think a lot of organizations don't really understand what that means. Um, they they value diversity and inclusion. And what we really want is different perspectives. We want someone who's going to challenge what is currently held. They want to move forward on institutional inertia. So draw out what you understand to be the challenge and how your experience will help improve on that. How are you going to, to make this a better organization or a different department or a different subject matter? What are you going to do to, to draw that out? So I think that is really helpful. I think those are sort of broad strokes of, of some of the areas that I think might be useful. I can go into a little more detail about CVs and covering letters, but I'm conscious of time and I don't want to go too far over, um, but really happy to answer any questions about, you know, some tips and tricks in terms of um, CV writing or personal statement writing that might be helpful as well. But I will pause there and we can go into some questions maybe. That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's really, really interesting. So, I mean, Obviously, one of the main things I'm getting from this is that we need to be active and we need to make sure we're up to date and we need to be present and we need to be engaged with this. And if we want to move on, we need to let people know what we've done. And often, you know, self-promotion is is quite a difficult challenge for a lot of people. I know a lot of people who are really good at doing it for others, but not good at doing it for themselves, you know, shouting everybody else's accolades. Thank you so much. Um, I think what we're going to do now, if, if it's OK with everybody, if anybody has got any questions specifically about this for Becca, can they please put them in the chat? But I just want to um, come back to a couple of issues. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the sort of key questions that have come out of the, of the chat here, which is looking at specific issues of pitfall, the pitfalls and challenges. Um, to producing impactful research. I mean, from my own perspective, I know um, because I work, I, I'm transdisciplinary. So because I worked in two different departments and had my feet in two different spaces and had two different hats on, often my department didn't really understand which, which language I should be using. So uh, as a medic and a sociologist, you know, they, they, they found it very difficult to um, sort of Give me the, the the help that I needed. So that was a real challenge. And so the way that I got over that was I went and spoke to somebody else from a different university who also I knew was working transdisciplinary. Um, I was encouraged to do transdisciplinary work, but then it turns out that, you know, there are challenges that come with that that make it very difficult to publish. Where do you publish, for example? So there's a number of questions here that sort of come up, which I think is um, I'd like to throw up and maybe to first start with Robert. Um, Scholarly um, use of language and, and, and having access to funds in the UK. Um, 
you know, what are the real challenges about getting funding, particularly for people, let's just say, who are who are not from the UK and are studying over in the UK? Are there any particular issues or, or ways that you can navigate through that getting funding, for example? Um, so I assume here we are talking about uh, funding for research. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so I think that's an important question and it is one that, um, uh, you know, because you may be in an, in an environment where you see everybody around you um, getting funding relatively uh, easily and you and you and you're wondering why why um, your experience is a little bit um, uh, different. So I think that's one of the things that is very, very important to understand very early on when you're embarking on an area of research. Understand what the funding landscape is and what the expectations are. Um, and then, of course, you, you need to then uh, define your own ambitions within those expectations uh, so that you are then able to deal with any uh, any any shocks that may be uh, on the way. Because in some research areas, you absolutely need funding. If you don't have funding, that's a showstopper. Um, and, and, and so, again, if I could just draw from my own experience, um, you cannot progress in my area if you don't have funding and you don't have uh, PhD students. And um, so I, I realized very early on that um, this was going to be the one of the harder things in my career, getting getting uh, getting funding uh, for various reasons. Um, and and so what so, so I factored that into my the way that I saw myself progressing, because I actually realized that I was going to have to probably work a lot harder to get that funding. So I threw my net much more widely. So um, I didn't necessarily count myself out of applying for things uh, if they looked like there were possibilities. Uh, and so uh, so one of the things that I, I, I then did is to cast, is, is I have had to cast my net very widely uh, as it is now common knowledge that for the last 15 years, I haven't had any grant from UKRI, which funds most chemistry research. But actually, it has had not the sort of impact it would have had on my career because I very quickly learned how to get funding from other places. I still applied for UK RI funding, but um, it never go through. But I had a healthy flow of funding from other places, and and so it, it one has to be innovative and understand their own area. So be an expert in your own area, know where the funding might come from, and and I think if you if you do that, then it is likely that you will succeed. I'm not saying it is the, the bullet that actually, or it is, the, it is the, the thing that actually deals with everything. The challenge is to, um, to, to, to try and get funding from the one place that everybody else is getting funding from, and you're not getting funding from there. And then if you don't get funding from there, you assume that you're a failure or that you're actually being heavily discriminated against. Both of those things, uh, one of those things is likely to be true. I don't think it means that you're a failure, but what it means is that you have to try other things and just to make sure you you succeed. The, the, the other thing that I will just throw in very quickly is that I, I realized early on in my career that I wasn't going to have a, a, a huge flow of PhD students coming into my group uh, because for reasons that I, I, I still trying to understand, I was not easily recruiting local students sort of um, uh, white students to my group. Uh, and so I had I had to come up with a strategy of avoiding that. Now, that may have been just specific to my own research area or whatever. So I had to find another source of, of students because without students, I couldn't succeed. So essentially what I'm saying is that um, these are the sort of pitfalls that one one has to be aware of. So um, get into an area with your eyes with your eyes wide open, as it were, and understand what the dynamics are in there. And then, of course, if it means that you have to work 200 times more than everybody else, if that's what it requires you to do and that's what you're ready to do, then do it. I suspect that success will tend to generally follow that. Thank you. That's really good. Um, uh, might, might I throw that open to you as well, Emmanuel, in terms of, you know, as head of a department, often funds are stretched. Um, and some people, do, you know, they might have to pay for particular um, qualifications, such as English um, as a foreign language. You have to get an English qualification if you're a, a student who's overseas. And a number of students, therefore, can be disadvantaged in many ways. 
um, either disadvantaged from the point of view that, you know, they've not had a strong support network. Maybe they're the first person in their in their family or close friends that have gone to university and, and, and are doing well. So as a head of department, how do you, you know, help them navigate these very difficult areas? Often maybe it's the first time um, as early career researchers that they're in that um, situation. Thank you. So uh, you're talking about PhD students. Yeah, so, going into uh, an early career researchers, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think for me, particularly the the specific example of of English language, I think that the I think it's more of my role as a supervisor, more than as a PhD as a head of department. So I, I supervise eight PhD students currently, and one of the things I try to train train them on is, you know, this is. This is your life in court, you know. This is a, this is not just a career. This is this is a scholarly life that you want to be introduced into, or you're being introduced into. And you, you just need passion. You need resilience. You need to. You really need to want to do the job to excel in it. Because I mean, perhaps it's been said, but one of the things is that is important to also mention is that this is a difficult job, right? So it's not it's not a walk in the park to be a, a solid academic. It's a difficult job. It's it's a rigorous, you know, it, you know, you're going to put in a lot of work to it, right? So I I try not to mince words with them at the early stage, and what that means is that I ask them to be creative about how they invest into their own lives. So Nottingham is very great. So uh, I think PhD students get about a thousand or so, or perhaps even more. Uh, uh, yearly that they can spend and things. So I tend to ensure that they spend that usefully, not for uh, not, not just for a fancy conference somewhere far away, but they look at, OK, there are so many free conferences they could attend uh, that could be in Birmingham, that could be in Aston, Leicester, you know, that they, it's just a train um, uh, ticket there and it's uh, uh, you know, and it's free for PhD students, a doctoral colloquium, for instance, so it's 50 pounds or something, right? So I tend to ensure that they use their money creatively so that they're able to cover more grounds, get more feedback, because at times you don't have to go to a prestigious conference in, in the US before you get the feedback you need. It could just be be in, in you know, in just across the road in, in, in trains, for instance. So, so you, you want to be able to make sure that you, you're thinking about investing uh, that way. But in terms of uh, maybe things like, I think one of the things we all struggle with if English is not your first language, it is writing better, better grammar, better syntax, and, and some, if you like, communicative effectiveness. I think uh, international students, you know, often would, would may tend to, to struggle uh, with that. Uh, and at times they, there needs to be investment in copywriting, especially if you're a third year PhD student and you're thinking of publishing in a journal, uh, uh, it, it might be necessary to invest in a copyright editor, proofreading your work and that sort of thing. So, uh, but I, I think as a departmental head, uh, what I also do mainly for staff is that, um, you know, I, I do approve requests for proofreading their work. Uh, I do approve uh, request for, for, you know, at times two or three times in the paper, but also uh, things such as submission fees. So particularly in my field or perhaps finance field, you have to pay to submit to some of these journals. So in terms of university investments, we, we ensure that those feed into, into those. But I think finally, I'd just like to, to say that again, you have to take ownership of your own scholarly life. And if you see it that way, it will matter less whether uh, you get support. Look at look at Robert's example. It wasn't successful with funding in one area. It moved on to another area. Uh, if I may also say this as politically correct as I can, because my boss is here, Robert, um, you you have to you have to see yourself as a scholar before an employee. So you, you're, you're a scholar first, 
and uh, your employment relationship is something that can change, but your scholarship is 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 still you die. I think that's extremely good advice. Um, one of the things that you talked about earlier, which has sort of been picked up in the chat here, is about defining niche, niche spaces. How can you do that? How can one do that? Mm. You talked about sort of going, OK, I'm going down the, the route of, you know, corporate governance mm. from your PhD work. Um, the question is, you know, is that is that often the way that you do it? You look at your PhD and go, that obviously a PhD is unique, otherwise you wouldn't get it. Mm. Um, how do you build? How do you build on that? How do you identify and create these niche spaces? That's to everybody. Yeah, please. Thank you. I think that the theme of that is, and for some people, it would happen during your PhD. For some people, it's going to happen when you're ECR. For some people, it's going to happen when you say associate professor or something. And you can even change. You can readapt your niche, and you used to be in this niche, and then you somewhere else. So, but in terms of practicality, you can look at it and say, so, so if I take my example. Hello, ma'am. Yes, ma niche doesn't have to be, uh, it could be empirical, right? So it could be that you're focusing on empirical uh, location that you're situating in your work. It could be theoretical and you're looking at a particular theory in a particular nuanced way and you're expanding that theory. It could be methodological, and that you, you you've developed this sophisticated sophisticated expertise in a particular methodology, in a particular uh, uh, you know uh, say technique within that methodology. So it could just be something as simple as as a validity test that you or your robustness test that you you know how to do right. Uh, and so the niche doesn't have to be. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, focusing on a particular area, a particular theory, a particular subset of a theory. So I, I was looking at um, institutional theory at the time, but now I'm looking at institutional logics within institutional theory. So it could be, it could be something that you just have to, you know, drive in and say, okay, I think, I think I can create a space for myself here that has not been really, really occupied. And what that does, it helps with your citation. It helps with your site. If, if that field develops into something big, it helps your citation. Uh, and, it, you know, you become, if you like, a reference point uh, for that particular area. So so I think, you know, for some people, it could be methodological. Uh, it could be a particular literature. It could be a particular country uh, methodology, as it were. Thank you. Thank you so, very much. So, Robert, so can I, I ask you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I have a re relatively short answer to um, to that that question about niche. Now, um, my 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 um, my most important advances have come out of um, something coming into my mind. It could be on a weekend when I'm relaxed, doing absolutely nothing. And as I think about it, I am absolutely sure that. I am the only person in the whole world who is actually thinking about that thing. Uh, and so I developed that idea in my mind. I develop it in terms of what the experiments might be and whatever. And I have had not many, a few of those occasions. Now, quite a lot of my research is about doing things and trying to do them quickly enough to get them out there before the competition beats me. Um, and that's fairly normal. But when I come up with those ideas, I know that there's nobody else thinking of, thinking about it. And so I can go away and spend six months, spend a year and a half, 18 months working on it. When it actually comes out, as Emmanuel said, it creates a completely new area. So if you look at some of my what, 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 some of my most cited work or where the impact has been greatest in terms of a scholarly impact, it is some of those things. And actually, sometimes when they came out, um, People sort of looked and said, "This is not. This is. This is not possible." And the other thing, from a scientific, from a STEM point of view, is easy things to do. Actually, the returns are easy. So uh, the the more difficult, the more outlandish. So one of the things that I I always challenge my students to 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 to, to think is, why has it never been done before? Why is it always done like that? Why is that the norm? Think outside the box. And that is what has actually brought um, the most rewarding um, outcomes in, 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 in my research. But then you have to be brave to do that. 
um, because actually sometimes that can bring issues with funding because you almost have to do it before you get funding for it because people will say it's impossible to be done. Anyway, it's something to think about. Can I just say something for 10 seconds, just, just to repeat what Robert said? You must not be drawn to easy things. If you want to take something out of this, learn how to do difficult things because that reduces the competition. Absolutely. <laughs> very, very wise words there. Um, I'm just going to turn this to um, thank you both very much. There's lots of other questions in the chat, which I don't think we're going to get round to doing because we're, we're sort of you know running out of time here. But one last question. I know, Becca, you've actually um, responded in the chat, but it would be really good if you could just talk um, to be, uh, to us through how, um, you know, in terms of building your CV, how, um, how, how we should go about doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jillian. And um, I did I did put a note in the chat there, but also, you know, if you ever want to have a, a chat about your CV, please feel free to get in touch with us at Parrot Labor. We can set aside some time to do that. Um, I think what is really important in your CV is to to think about your achievements, not just your responsibilities. And I think what we see a lot is people want to sort of throw the kitchen sink at, well, I have responsibility for all these areas. And that's great. You know, typically within higher education roles, we have a sense of what the types of responsibilities you'll have. So we know if you're head of a department, you have responsibility for research outputs within that department for workload planning for that sort of thing. But what we actually want to know is what's the impact you've had in post. So how many staff have you recruited in that time? What's the turnover been? How how is your NSS improved or not improved? What's the awarding gap like? What is the workload planning model? Has that shifted? Is there more improvements? Is staff satisfaction increasing? Those are the achievements that speak to your responsibilities. So find a way to draw those out. Um, very quickly, and I know this wasn't asked, but I do want to highlight it because it is incredibly important, is please do not overlook the importance of your personal statement or your covering letter. Um, it is actually, I would say, in I did I worked on um, about a dozen um, vice chancellor appointments in the last two years and I would say in those most usually people are looking at the covering letter first because what they want to see is your vision your understanding of the context of the institution you're applying for and what you're going to do about it and that applies that's not just vice chancellor appointments that's I would say every appointment in a leadership position is they want to know that you understand their context you understand them as an institution why you're motivated for it and what you're going to do about it and so please do not underestimate the power of your personal statement draw on your lived experience draw on your um, professional experience it's an incredibly powerful tool please do use it Thank you so much. There is just one more question. Can I just squeeze one more question in, Ade? Please, please, please. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, this is well, it's directed to you, Emmanuel, actually, um, saying that you've worked at different universities in the UK. And um, this is a great question, actually. Can you provide some insights into the differences working in post-1992 versus Russell Group Universities? Um, and she's interested, uh, they're, they're interested, sorry, in, in um, how you've navigated the pitfalls at the post-1992 versus the Russell Group universities. Great question. Thank you. I, I think there are pitfalls everywhere. Uh, so I started off, uh, in, uh, so I finished PhD at CAS, which is a pretty well-known business school. I think it's now called Bayes Business School. And I, I did my first job at Northumbria. That provided an opportunity for me uh, because I, at the time when I was finishing PhD, I probably I think I had a couple of book chapters and maybe a few papers under review and, and maybe a one star paper or something like that. So. Uh, the profile I had, they gave me an opportunity, a chance to kickstart my career, right? So so that was great. So you've got to be able to appreciate uh, opportunities for what they represent at the time. So so I, I went in there and as my career and my research profile developed, I, I was able to move on to, to Durham. In terms of pitfalls, uh, you would expect that you have less time to do research in post 92, usually speaking. However, it's all about, you know, uh, these conversations I talked about earlier with regards to having a chat with your head of department and saying, you know, if you if you I can do these these X, Y and Z meet some of your departmental priorities, if you relieve me off some of these and I use that time for some of this, I'm not saying it's a conversation that would always be that straightforward, but that's that's the approach that often works. So 
Then I moved on to Durham. It was a different um, kettle of fish, as it were. Uh, in post ninety two universities, you you're encouraged to do research, uh, very much encouraged to do research. Uh, but most of the time, you may not get penalised for not doing research or publishing high quality research. In in the traditional type universities, you will be. So you've got to bear that in mind. So you want to move to a university where you are sure that you're ready for the pressures that, it, that they may potentially come with. But a great thing about building your overall profile, and of course, uh, you know, people would, would pursue different pathways. So you've got Robert who's been in Nottingham for uh, a couple of decades as it were. So that people with such career paths, there's also people that, that have moved uh, moved around. But there are advantages everywhere, and that's my view about it. So a lot of my leadership on, on teaching leadership, on TEF, on NSS, and student experience, on decolonizing the curriculum, on many of these other things were things uh, I did more of uh, at the Monfort University. So there are opportunities everywhere. If you're in a post 92, don't, don't be swamped under by the pitfalls. The opportunities are there. You can you can contribute to TEF because uh, most post 92 got a TEF gold, right? So, so they're doing something really great. So you want to plug into that because that would help you uh, going forward in terms of the narrative of, of your contributions. Uh, and if you're in the Russell Group University as well, uh, you know, punch heavy and apply for funding. Often uh, uh, university affiliation, some people have a view that, that it does matter in, in some of these things. So wherever you are, get the advantages, right? And, and uh, navigate the disadvantages, as it were. One of the the obvious ones is that you, the pressure is less in post night, especially in terms of research performance. In 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 many Brussels reviews, so if they work, for instance, you'll be kicked out within, you know, within a few years if you don't <laughs> if you don't publish the papers that, that they want you to. So 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 there are, you know, it's a different kettle of fish at the end of the day. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I appreciate that you've let us run over five minutes, uh, David. I want to thank um, our speakers today. They were absolutely fantastic. Professor Robert Makaya, Professor Emmanuel Edigbite, and Dr. Becky Franson. And I'm sure people can reach out to you via the um, Society of Black Academics um, network. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for thank excellent you. sharing thank you, and moderating, Gillian. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Andy. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, uh, to our speakers and our moderator. Uh, insightful um, comments and uh, direction as well. I think we all learned a lot from this session. Um, before we close, we need, uh, we're going to hear from um, Professor Ken Kamuchi and Professor Kenneth Ameshi as they round off, then I would do the final you know, sort of uh, updates for our next events. Over to you, Professor Ken Kamushi and uh, Professor Amishi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, our panelists has been fascinating. Uh, thank you for organizing this 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 conference. And also, uh, I thank you to all the participants uh, who have shared their reflections with us. Uh, it's been very stimulating, very inspirational, and very thought provoking especially for early career researchers. Uh, what I will do, I just take a couple of minutes just to draw together some of the, you know, some of the key strands. Um, and just to mention that I think it's now being recognized. We accept that uh, impact uh, and relevance are, are part of uh, the raison d'etre, if you like, uh, of universities and researchers uh, working as individuals uh, or as collaborative teams. So the various domains here that we're looking at, we're looking at research excellence and, and impact on policy impact on communities around us and in other countries. And I'm aware that there are some colleagues here who are doing some excellent work that's having significant impact on communities up and down the continent of Africa, as, as well as here in the UK. UK. So it's also about impact across, uh, impact on the students across the board, you know, undergraduates, uh, uh, research students, impact on colleagues and mentoring others. So it's about making a difference and bringing out, you know, meaningful, bring about meaningful change. So I think as black scholars, we have we have something unique to offer. And I think this was made very clear to me right from the start of my career when I uh, when I went for an interview uh, to for the scholarship that brought me to Oxford, uh, where, where they asked me, you know, 
you're talking about how you hope to benefit and how you want to build a career, but what are you going to offer the university? What are you going to offer the United Kingdom? Uh, and, and this has remained a massive burden for me throughout my careers, my career as a researcher. Uh, um, but what really helped me was that I had spent some months on an internship in Europe, and, and I encountered some very negative perceptions of Africa. And it was at that point that I realized that I was in a very privileged position to help advance understanding of Africa and, and to change some of those uh, perceptions. And that I think is really what drove me to, to embark on research that sought to understand Africa. So it led me to uh, research that sought to help to, to improve management practices in Africa, challenging contemporary theories, exploring the case for, say, indigenous solutions. So I, I went to Japan for about a month for my master's degree uh, to, to learn more about Japanese management and, and how it could help uh, change practice in Africa. So, it's, so it was about wanting to make a difference. And, and when I subsequently did an, a, a doctorate, it was also very much about uh, playing to those particular strengths and, and, and building confidence. So the thing to note is that, you know, impact doesn't materialize from, from, from nothing. You know, to, 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 to quote Charlie Mingus, uh, uh, jazz basis, who said, you can't improvise on nothing, man. You got to improvise on something. So I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, impact for me anyhow, is, is, is the outcome of the great work that you do, uh, which in turn is conceived from the very profound research questions that drive that research in the first place. So it's about quest asking questions that no one else is asking. It's about drawing from disciplines that you know offer genuinely novel insights. Some of my earlier work on human resource management and organizational studies um, drew from very unusual theoretical fields, such as social anthropology, philosophy, jazz improvisation, and, and, and wanted to take a very eclectic approach to theory, identifying a niche, some of the things that have been mentioned by the, some of the panelists. And it's about doing interdisciplinary research. And, and to me, these are the real pathways to making an impact and, and, and doing something different. So as, 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 as a Deerfield student, um, uh, I actually managed to get a book chapter uh, and, and a two-star paper and a three-star paper accepted while I was doing, doing my doctorate. So my, in, in conclusion, I think my, my, my advice would be to, to, to ask oneself, where, where do you want to be located within your community of researchers? Uh, for me, I, I wanted to be the top researcher on, on African management. That was really what drove me right from the start. It wasn't about wanting to be a professor, uh, although some, this was ultimately at the back of my mind, as, as Emmanuel was saying, this is something that's at the back of my mind, but that's not what you're targeting. At least that's not what I was targeting. In fact, I was thinking maybe after 15 years, I would move out and do, become a consultant or something, but here I am. So so what is it you want to be remembered for? What, what's your legacy? Uh, so, so a career for me is, 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 is a journey, it's a process. It's about being an expert. It's about being the best you can be. Um, and, and, and some of the important words that have come up in these conversations are about passion, resilience, about knowing yourself, it's about being very focused on your career and finding the best place to do it. So for, for me, the, 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 the starting place was the University of Birmingham. That's my first job as a lecturer. But when I found that I wasn't getting the support that I needed, I moved away. I was very interested in Asia, so I went to live in Hong Kong. Initially, for you know, the idea was to live there for two years. But I, I found the work that I was doing there so fascinating because it, it was helping me to understand much of Asia. So I ended up living there for many years, and then coming back to the UK because I felt that the work that I was doing at that point uh, had relevance, and I was going to get much more support uh, here in the UK. So everyone's journey is different, and as we've seen, um, uh, it, it, it's about uh, creating something for yourself. So I would, I would, I would just conclude by wishing everyone else, everyone the best, uh, and 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 again, just thanking you all for your for participating in this conference, and I look forward to uh, seeing you again at the next event. Thank you very much, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kamuche. Um, over to you now, Professor Ameshi, and then I would, don't go yet. We, we I would then give a concluding remark for our next event. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I think it has been an interesting morning and uh, early afternoon. Um, so I thank, uh, first of all, Ken Kamuche for hosting this. Um, but I also thank Adit in a very uh, great way, because uh, for those who do not know, um, this thing started as a conversation between uh, Adit and my son. And I haven't met Adit in person, you know, so <laughs> all the while we, we talk online on chat. Um, I can't remember how we connected, but I did, you know, uh, was asking me how I was able to become a professor at the University of Edinburgh and what it felt like being a, a black professor in that sense. 
So and um, the questions we are coming, and we thought I thought the questions were interesting, and I challenged him. I said, "Why don't you organize something where we can share this uh, with uh, uh, other people?" And he took that challenge, and that for me is leadership. Right? And if we are talking about impact, you don't need to be a professor to do these things uh, Ade has been able to do. So, um, and we talk about gaps. Uh, it was Professor Emmanuel Obona that was talking about some of the gaps, institutional issues. Wherever we find gaps, let's try to fill those gaps. If we don't fill those gaps, nobody will fill them for us. The, the other people have their priorities and you don't expect them to suddenly make your priorities to their own priorities. So, and we don't necessarily need to blend them. And that's why I think the, the, the spirit behind our conversation is one to be applauded. It's not just about mourning or complaining, but we're also thinking, okay, creatively, we recognize the barriers, the challenges, but how do we navigate through them? So um, Ade, I, I congratulate you and I, I encourage you to um, keep doing what you're doing. And for others also who can support, Ade can do this in alone. So there is also an opportunity to volunteer, to support him, to grow the network, and the network uh, truly should be ours. And one thing I want to leave you with is uh, we talked about impact in, in, in ways that would suggest that it's like a linear or one directional movement. So the, the, the world of practice comes into the academia. Um, that's one way to think about it. But from our career perspective, we can also think of how we can go to the world of practice. Um, just to give you an example, when I had a chance to do my sabbatical, I didn't go to a, a university and I didn't want to because you know, leaving University of Edinburgh to go to another university is the same thing, literally. So I made it a point to do my sabbatical in, in, in a policy organization. So I spent it with the National Pension Commission Nigeria. And for me, it was a fantastic experience. One year, uh, not doing research, per se, but observing things. And to a large extent, it has helped me to understand the world of practice. Right, so uh, let's not always think that the world of practice needs to come to us, but we can also go to the world of practice. And there's also something that comes with engaging with practice and policy, that's the confidence. Well, that confidence can only come through experience. Uh, let us also be willing to make our mistakes. And for those of us who are much more experienced in working with companies or with government, let us also find ways to incorporate um, earlier career uh, fellows or even professors that are not experienced in terms of working with uh, policymakers. So um, I'll be looking out uh, for people who might be interested in that. And if you think it's something you want to explore, maybe a day there is also a space in future to do something about how do you do consulting? How do you do policy work? And how do you get into that and, and network? Um, probably it will also help a lot of us who might be thinking in that direction. But there's also money to be made. Academia, we shouldn't be poor. Um, <laughs> and I mean, we tell you know, we are yes, we may be socialists or Marxists or whatever. We are le we lean to the political left, um, but we should make it fun and, and we should enjoy what we do. And what we do should pay for the kind of life we want. So um, I think there are different ways to make that happen. And I encourage as much as we think of impact, impacting the world. Let us also make sure we are not left behind by also impacting ourselves. And uh, <laughs> I'll leave you on that positive note. Uh, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. And that Thank comedy you note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kenneth Ameshi. Fantastic. Thank you so much to everybody that has come here today, our guest speakers, uh, our moderators. I just want to tell you guys something. It was not easy to get all these people to be in one room on, on, on the same day, it was very difficult. So I really appreciate our guest speakers. They are very busy people, but they were able to make it. I also do appreciate our moderators as well. But I just want to point out that I wouldn't have been able to, or this event wouldn't have happened without our uh, SBA event team. So we do have a, an event team and I just want to appreciate them. So we have uh, Dr. Peolua Ayeni Toju at Manchester Metropolitan University. She handles uh, our projects and events team and, and some of the initiatives we do. We also have Dr. Mercy Donedo, who is at Durham University. Mercy also helps and supports with our projects and our initiatives. But aside that, we have um, Dr. Bola Babajide at the Montfort University, and she deals more with our strategic partnerships because we still look for sponsors, in fact, strategic sponsors. So um, Dr. Bola is in charge of that. But we have our marketing. So sometimes you see we post um, good news about what black academics are doing. 
we have Oyebola Toyeshe who manages our marketing and communications. We also have Oni Consola Ige at Bayes, City University London, and she does more of our resourcing. So we have a structure actually, and we still do need more people to volunteer and help us with regards to some of these activities. And of course, we have Juliet Ocheja as well, who helps and currently is managing, uh, helping us with managing our membership for SBA. So thank you very much. We have um, other events coming up. Our next event is at King's College London. It's, it's going to be our first face-to-face -face event. So we are quite excited and we're looking forward to that. That is going to be in November. We're thinking first weekend, probably a Friday in November. And who knows, maybe you guys could stay back in London and enjoy the weekend. It could be a weekend off in London. But that will hopefully be a networking event where we actually get to see each other face to face. But we are actually going to be putting a virtual section as well for that. We also have other initiatives where we are supporting students. We are doing that uh, because, of course, it's good for black academics to progress, but it's important to also uh, ensure that our students are not left behind as well. So we have some of the smaller workshops we do for students and we promote that via social media, especially on Instagram. So please do join and um, do support in any little way. And to end, it is about mentorship. And we are currently working on the mentorship scheme where some of our very top influential figures here today can hopefully partake in, in, in some of those initiatives. And we will definitely reach out to you when we have finalized plans on that. We will also be launching our new website very soon. We are working on that at the moment. And once we do, we will, uh, of course, publicize that. Reach out to us via our social media sites, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And please tweet about this event. Go back to your universities and um, uh, um, have an impact. And let people know that SBA exists and we are trying to uh, uh, you know, push out, serve as a community, a voice for black academics. And ho hopefully we can all you know, make some progress and, and live happily ever after. Thank you very much and uh, see you guys very soon in our next event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Thank everyone. You so see, see you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.